Leave it. All looking well. So this is the orchard. And here's a car door. It's got Jack in the pulpits or Lords and Ladies, whatever you want to call them, coming up. And lots of mosses. This corridor of trees runs between our orchard, you can see through there, and our woods. And I'm trying to create a bit of beauty, if you will, when you're here in the orchard so that you can look down into the woods and see snowdrops and bluebells and wood anemones and I've only just started sowing snowdrops in this area. The wooden enemies I've been sowing, they're over there for years. But there's patches that I sowed last year of snowdrops. But from here, you can see. Hey, you. You beautiful kitty. Yeah. From here, you can see, you can see the bluebells. Those green spikes, those are all bluebells. And I've planted a few snowdrops. You really can't see them yet. I only did it last year. So I'm going to get more snowdrops and plant them in here. So that when I'm looking, when I'm here, looking at the sheep in the orchard in the winter, I can look this way and see the beautiful, um, swathe of white snowdrops. You can see there's lord and ladies coming up over there. Cow parsley, which is all later in the year. So I'm talking about early spring. Now I've put, there's, you can see a few snowdrops right there. I'll come at it from a different angle. So you see this sty and this is the orchard. So I will go to the little gate at the end and walk over to where the snowdrops I planted last year are. But I want to plant more because I want to make it look beautiful. I'm all for making it look beautiful and nature friendly. Isn't that right, kitty? Which is why I don't like laurels, which is what I'm, this is. This is a laurel. So there are the sheep coming back from their feed. bear, but they're all going to the hay bale. And they're all going, what is she doing in the woods? <coughs> Curious about me in the woods. Isn't that right? Here comes Kestrel, being curious as to what I'm doing in the woods and some more lambs. What is she doing in the woods? Mm. Hey girls, how are you? Mm. They're trying to grab a few bits of laurel or something. Oh, you're coming down here. Mustard's not going to appreciate that. <laughs> All there. Yes. So, if I pull this down, are you going to eat a laurel? Yeah, you're going to eat a bit of laurel. You want a little bit of laurel. See, they prevent this from getting out of control. This is a good thing about sheep. This non-native 
which doesn't really contribute to biodiversity. They control so it doesn't get out of hand. My grandfather planted the laurel. Basically to fill the woods up a bit. Anyway, <laughs> the meeting of the sheep and the cats, the community under the laurel. <laughs> see, that's a favorite itching branch. You can see her starting to itch her back, going like, oh, yeah, that feels good. You can see she's itching her back. You've made a hollow in your back. Actually, no, that's where I shore her because she got a bit of fly strike. So there we go. Pretty is a picture. Dogs and cats and sheep under a laurel. Okay, I'm gonna go and do what I was gonna do at the very beginning. He's already gone to where I'm going. Can you move? I'm not gonna step over this. Oh, no, it's solid enough. I'll step over this. I might fall, but I'll step over it. Everybody's wondering what I'm doing. They're all curious. It needed two hands and a bit of strength to get over this wooden sty. So that's where the sheep are in the orchard. This is a very old retaining wall. I built this fence nearly 25 years ago, between 23 and 25 years ago, so that I could graze the orchard and get it back because it was fully overgrown with ivy and seedlings and brambles and you couldn't get into it. Look at her trying to reach up to get a bit of windblown laurel. See, does she grab some? Yes. She's got a bit of wind blown laurel. As the wind blows it, she can grab a piece. There we go. Clever kestrel. And her mates are coming over and saying, hmm, I'll have some of that too. Oh, a lame mate. Okay, the reason I came over the fence was to show you, so you can see there's some lords and ladies. The wind is picking up. Look, they're beginning to come up with their arrow-shaped leaves. The sheep don't eat them because they're poisonous, but they're a native species. So here's bluebells, loads of bluebells. These are all bluebells and cow parsley. And then last year, where's my first planting of snowdrops I did up here? Oh, here it is. Here. I planted a few snowdrops up here. There's another one there. You can see here. And then over here, I planted more. You can see there's more snowdrops and more snowdrops. So what I'm doing is Here's more snowdrops than I planted as well. You can see. So I'm bringing snowdrops from other locations and going to spread them all out through here. About 20 odd years ago, more or less, I brought up some wood anemone. Actually, it'd be let, you know, it would be about 20 years ago at this stage. I brought up the wood anemone and planted it here and I threw bluebell seeds about the place because this was covered in ivy and completely overgrown. You can see this is one of the last trees that I chopped the ivy off of right here. You can see that was covered in ivy, but it was so covered in ivy, this woodland, that there was a monoculture of ivy on the understory. So this is me managing it so that there's snowdrops and bluebells and cow parsley and lords and ladies. So there's a biodiversity of the understory for pollinators and birds and voles and all kinds. So it's all about biodiversity, not monocultures. So here you can see I'm stepping all over bluebells that are coming up. So it's a whole process and it takes years to regenerate uh, biodiversity when a monoculture takes hold like ivy. 
and I'm allowing ivy. There is ivy here. You can see ivy's climbing up over there. Ivy's over there. There's ivy over there. So there's ivy around. It's just, I don't want it all ivy. I want the biodiversity. So pollinators can now eat pollen from the snowdrops. And the next will be the bluebells. And there you can see the sheep in the orchard. So this is what I look out for. These two clumps are all on their own of snowdrops. And sometimes when they clump together for a long time, they stop doing flowers because they're so tightly up. Oh, look, she scared a honeybee away. There was a honeybee pollinator in the snowdrops, which is exactly why I um, like making them prolific across the land this time of year, because it's the hungry gap for the pollinators because the holly flowers aren't happening, so they're not getting any um, pollen from them. So I'll dig these two up and I'll spread them in this area and then I'll take some of them and spread them in that area up there where I just was. So that's one of my ways of spreading the uh, pollen for pollen. Spreading the biodiversity for pollinators, not just bees, but any of them that are out and about because this is the importance here. Pollinators, food for them. Isn't that right, kitty? <laughs> and I'll probably leave this tree down. It's a cherry tree, sadly. My grandfather planted loads of cherry trees and you can see it just toppled over. But I'll leave it as it is. It's wonderful for moss. I might trim off some branches so that I can walk around it, but there's no need for me to pull it up or chop it up unless I run out of firewood. And that's not likely to happen anytime soon, is it? No, no, you good pup. I to also mention the uh, aconites, which are gorgeous, the yellow aconites. So I spread them around as well. You can see there was a big bunch of them here in one location and I spread them out all over here. So hopefully they'll develop into bunches and the bluebells down here. And then I would spread snowdrops along here. There weren't any before. So you can see it slowly but surely spreading plants that my grandfather planted decades and decades ago. This is a steep embankment. I'm not going down that way. But I'd love to get this, like all carpets of snowdrops. The only enemy I really have for the snowdrops are um, the white-toothed shrew, which is an invasive species. So it goes along and will eat the bulbs. Another reason to spread them all over the place is to make it so it's harder for the white-tailed shrew, white-toothed shrew to eat them and devour them all. Uh, and it makes it easier for prey animals to eat them like the birds, owls, um, birds of prey, etc. So there we go. Talking about biodiversity, I planted loads of crocuses. You can see them all coming up here all along the, this bank, embankment. All the purple ones are coming up first. You can see, I didn't plant them there. This is sown seeds. I planted these all in the autumn of 2017. There you go, there's some yellow ones and some purple ones. And these cool ones that I love with the dark stripe. Anyway, I've planted over a thousand bulbs along here. Well, myself and somebody else planted a thousand bulbs along here. And again, we have the problem with the uh, shrew. But these like a sunny place, which is different from the woods that are up there. So that's why, and these again are for the pollinators, for those who break their hibernation early. And I'm trying to get them to spread out 
all in the lawn and things. And every year I plant a few more out in there. You can see here. Whoops. There's a few there that are planted out. The yellow, the purple, and the white one. So trying to spread them as far and wide as possible. And they're so beautiful. So delicious for all the pollinators. And it looks beautiful. As my sister says, it looks like there's a Easter egg hunt along here when they all come in bloom. And they're getting there. It'll take some time. Problem is the pheasant love eating the flower heads. So there might be loads of flowers one day and then the next there's none because the pheasants have come along and plucked all their heads off. You can see there's there's loads of stalks. There's flowers, but there's also loads of stalks in there. So if we didn't have as many pheasants in the area, we might have a lot more pollinating crocuses like there as well. <laughs>